Welcome. We are going to be talking about Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It was the most popular play and had a lot of adaptations. You probably know Leonardo DiCaprio's version. Um, first performance was in 1900s and a lot of other people performed the play around the world and actually we don't really need to worry about this so much because in this class we're not going to be talk so much about historical t context of the play but just the play itself as Shakespeare might say. You might already know the story of Romeo and Juliet because it's a trope. A trope is a commonly held idea that most of us go when we read the literature. A flower is a trope. So a flower is something that's beautiful. A girl can be a flower or light can be a trope for knowledge. The play Romeo and Juliet is a trope about boy meets girl, star-crossed lovers. So boys fall in love with girls and that's a common trope that you see in movies and different plays like this. Now, when I was talking about historical time, we need to take an approach that's called New Criticism. New Criticism um, started in 1900s. That was the idea that we want to look at the text itself and try to say what we see in the text itself, not in the literary criticism, not what teacher thinks, not what movie says, but just the play itself. We care what Shakespeare thought about the play. Um, but we do not want to do paratext. Anything that is outside the text doesn't interest us. So you don't need to go study the history. You do not need to look the words. You just need to um, look in the text and fall in love with the text itself. So to understand Shakespeare, we need to know a few things. Primarily, we need to know the genre of the book. So it is drama. What is drama? What does it mean? How should I read this? We think about drama, most importantly, we think about being performed on a stage. Actors, actresses. And we have to imagine in our mind that it's a play. So what's going on on the stage? Where are the people standing? What is their facial expression? Is there a bit, is there is like a knife? What are they doing? So when you are reading, you need to visualize what's happening on the stage. This is very different from, from a novel and from a movie. People actually perform this on the stage. You have to think about this. Second of all, we need to remember that a play is something that is spoken. It doesn't meant to be read at all. We read Shakespeare now, we study him, but no one did that in the past. They watched Shakespeare on the stage. They only read it so they can perform it. This is very important to keep in mind. And also, when you come across the language of Shakespeare, it's very difficult. I don't understand this. It's meant to be spoken. It meant to be performed. Read the lines out loud. Think about where the pauses are, which words are important. This is going to help you understand some difficult parts because Shakespeare is quite difficult. Now, he is difficult, but he is important. Most of us believe that Shakespeare is the best writer in history of the Western literature, so, so studying Shakespeare is wonderful. What I hope to do in this course is not just help you understand this one play, Romeo and Juliet. That's not really important. It's important, but what important is how we approach any play. That's the goal of this class. How can I come to understand the play? How can I read the play, not just this play? So at the end of the course, Hopefully you will understand Romeo and Juliet and you will like it, but more importantly, you can read any other play and enjoy it as well. So to get more into drama, I want to cover drama. How do I read the play? Drama has three key aspects that we need to understand. The first of these is called stage directions. As you read the play, you notice moments when something is not part of the play. It's telling you what to do like enter the stage, take up a knife, kiss the girl. These are stage directions. You also see like a Latin term, 
exit. That means everyone exit the stage. Those stage directions are important because they help us to visualize the play. Shakespeare actually doesn't like, um, doesn't use them very often. He doesn't often tell you what they do. This is great because we can imagine what they do. And when we imagine where they're standing, how they look, this can help us think about what it means. And that's the goal of literature, is thinking about what does it mean at large. So the second key aspect is dialogue. Dialogue, the word die and log, word, two words, dialogue, two people speaking. A lot of Shakespeare is dialogue, two people on the stage talking to each other. That's one type of dialogue, but there is more. There is also monologue. Mana means one. Logo means words. So one character speaks and no one else talks back to him. That's a monologue. You will notice a lot in Shakespeare. It's key passages. The most beautiful writings of Shakespeare, but even the most beautiful monologue is soliloquy. A person speaks and other characters cannot hear him, only the audience can hear. Normally, they are very beautiful parts of Shakespeare. We will look closely at soliloquy, uh, soliloquy later. Sometimes we have the aside. When there are two characters, they are next to each other and one of them turns aside like this and says he doesn't know the audience hear but that character doesn't hear this is very interesting the audience knows something that but this character does not know that's how we can create dramatic irony tension and sometimes we can see a lot of this in all shakespeare's plays in all other plays as well so the last type of dialogue we need to know it's not a common, it's called a chorus. This comes from the Greek, actually, when you open Romeo and Juliet, you see chorus at the start. So, chorus tells the audience what's happened. It gives context, it gives you the setting, it gives who the characters are, it summarizes the action in a way that um, it represents So the first thing that you read um, is you're reading what's happening. So to familiarize you with the reading, with the text. The third thing um, is probably the most important is the persona. So basically the cast of characters, who is in the play. Of course, a play has to have characters. It's not like a novel that you read and that you discover characters. A play tells you on the very first page everyone who is in the play and who they are. I highly recommend you, in order for you to understand the drama, look closely at the characters, see what their relationships are, and then when you read, you encounter those characters, who they are, flip back to the pers personas and check, and then you will better understand when you read and won't get lost with all the characters. Romeo and Juliet has, I think, around 20 characters. That's a lot of characters. So familiarize yourself and we'll talk about characters later. So much for the three key aspects of the play. Wanna move on. So let's talk about genre. So you understand two main types of drama. There's opera, when people sing, like ladies sing. And there is like theater in Japan, in Italy. But we want to talk about two basic forms, comedy and tragedy. Comedy, it's funny. Tragedy, it's not funny. It's very sad. But we want to go further than that. Why is it funny? Or Romeo and Juliet, why is it sad? Or even better, why is it tragic? Okay, the comedy is the opposite of tragedy. All comedies start in chaos. Something horrible is happening. Then in the end, it's perfectly ordered. Everyone is happy. Shakespeare's comedies, everyone gets married. 
everyone gets married. But in the tragedy, everything starts pretty good. But in the end, everything is chaos. And they don't end with marriages. Normally, it's many people dying, quite tragic. So let's look at tragedy. Aristotle. I do not know if you've heard, but he is very famous, very important to Western literature and the study of it. Long time ago, this Greek thinker wrote a book. It's called Poetics. We still use it today to understand tragedy, even though it's been over 2000 years. Aristotle's Poetics. We don't have his writings on comedies necessarily, but we have all of his thoughts that he wrote down on tragedy. He tells us some things about what makes something a good tragedy. And we still follow this today. Shakespeare himself seems to follow it in Romeo and Juliet. The three aspects that I want to go through of tragedy were three difficult things that you need to remember. There are also two other things I want to remember as well. So we will have five things all together about tragedy. First, let's compare it to comedy again. Aristotle says that tragedy has a sense of probability and comedy sense of possibility. If you look at these two words very closely, probability means it's probably, it can happen, it's believable. Possibility, it could happen, but it's not likely. Think about something funny, something walking alone, something and then he bumps into a tree, that's possible, but how likely is that to happen? So it's very unlikely. So when it happens, it's very funny. Probability. It's when it probably would happen. So when we reach, when we read Romeo and Juliet, then we should think about things that happened to Romeo and Juliet. Are they probable? Could they have happened? Does Shakespeare make it believable? That adds to the tragic elements. We want to look for tragic characters. The character cannot be just said. He has to have some qualities that makes us understand that he will get a tragic ending. Aristotle says there are three tragic aspects of the character. First, hubris. It's translated like prideful tendencies, pride. When we look at the play, we want to think, is Romeo prideful? Does he have something about him that he has egotistical elements? What is pride? Pride can be when I put myself in a situation of great danger. That's also pride for no matter what comes, I can deal with it. Is Romeo like that? Does he have pride? Second point is Hamoratio. Hamoratio is kind of similar to pride. It's more general. It's tragic flaw. What is Romeo's tragic flaw? Does he have one? For Aristotle, if Romeo is a tragic figure, he needs to have it. So we need to look for it, not just for Romeo, but also for Juliet, for other characters, for all of them. Are they tragic? The last point that Aristotle outlines for tragedy is agnorisis. That's a long, difficult word, but it's a very important concept. So agnorisis means um, discovery. So you have your figure, he is tragic, but something happened when he realizes that all the things that he did led to this point, and he realizes that adds to the tragedy. I definitely believe that Romeo and Juliet, they have these characters. If you read through, we want to look for these points of discovery. When characters understand that everything that came to be, they realize it. So, to talk a little bit, main question, what is drama? Main point I want you to remember, it's meant to be performed. Talk to you later.